So I'm giving the talk on behalf of Philippa, who apologised for not being able to make it. She, Philippa, um, in your satchel, I think you've got a copy of basically um, a policy brief on the guidelines on hepatitis B and C testing. So WHO has developed up these guidelines and hopefully they will be available in full soon. Um, Philippa, to acknowledge her, was the driving force at WHO in, in getting these guidelines worked on and through. I was the co-chair with Philip Chow and there were many other people and other people in this room who, um, who contributed to the guidelines. Guidelines are always, in presentations, incredibly boring presentations. I thought of putting in the middle of the slide some jokes and various things, but I'm just going to try and play it straight and fast um, and just say, at the get-go, why the heck do you need guidelines? And it's a little bit like, why do you need elimination targets? Guidelines are, seem dry and there's processes around how you do them, but they're actually really important because, particularly in resource-limited countries, they are used um, as tools by government or as pushing government to begin to do things. And they don't always get followed, and the science is not always perfect in them, but they are a starting point, and I think it's really important that we have our first lot of, of guidelines for hepatitis B and C testing. The general philosophy behind these guidelines was to go, there are not enough people being tested at all. There are, and, and, and we've seen data, and I'll show you a slide, but basically, if I was to say there's not enough people being tested for hepatitis B and C who are at risk of it and who have it. And that what we had to do is develop these guidelines to reflect that problem and to say, in a world where we're trying to reach elimination of these two diseases as public health threats by 2030, what do these guidelines need to look like to help countries upscale the testing that is a really important component if we're to follow by, by treatment or vaccination or whatever it might be? So that when you look at the guidelines, um, I think that's something to take in mind. The other thing I will say to you is it, similarly to some other guidelines I've been involved with, reminded me, and I think this is, again, something to remind all of us in the room who are combination clinician, clinician researchers, researchers, public health people, is the constant lack of quality evidence that we had around implementation and the work, and that we all need to be thinking when we're doing work, if we're doing our implementation work, are there ways we can be measuring it and evaluating it to the next set of guidelines rather than there being conditional recommendations moderate or low quality evidence, that that is changed to strong recommendations, high quality evidence. And we see this a lot in the guidelines when you actually look for the true evidence that there's a lack of quality evidence. So I would encourage us all, including myself, to keep that in mind and be constantly when we're doing work saying, is there a way we can measure and evaluate and write it up and have it published so that our guidelines, be it in treatment, in care, in testing, can be strengthened. So that's sort of my background kind of commentary on the talk as well. Again, I'd like to acknowledge Philippa, who, who wrote the talk, I'm, and, and this is her talk, which I'm giving, with a few things from me. So I think Godfrey highlighted yesterday there's been a series of guidelines coming through around hepatitis C and hepatitis B, and that's really important. And uh, basically, this is to try and help low, particularly, and, and when you think about WHO, it's aimed not at high-income countries, but low- and middle-income countries to, to begin to develop action plans and the like. And it's so that we can get here and, and how you can do working within this universal health coverage and continuity of service. We saw this slide yesterday, and I think the important thing really to highlight is if we are going to get this cascade, rather than looking like that, looking like that, we really need to work on testing. Testing is absolutely key here. Because so many people globally, there's a few exceptional countries, but so many people globally who are at risk of or have these diseases are undiagnosed. And that, as I said, was the emphasis of the guidelines to go, whilst we recognise some of these recommendations as not as strongly evidence-based as we would like, our aim, the balance of what we need to do is get testing out there as opposed to going, we have to have perfect quality evidence um, before we encourage testing. Either I'm doing something wrong or my slide is stuck. Are you able to move this one along, please? Thank you. There are barriers all the way along. And one of them, a keen one, is a lack of awareness, both of patients and of health services clinicians to do things. 
information, cultural beliefs, that real concern about getting testing. We saw this in the HIV days, but also what we saw is that people were very prepared to have testing if there was an outcome that they were going to be able to get on treatment. So I think it's also, though, and people say, well, also, maybe you shouldn't test if you don't have treatments available. But what we also saw from HIV is that when people were aware that they were positive and did not access treatment, that's when you actually get the power of the community demanding for changes and demanding that treatment be available to them. So I think when people are often anxious about that concept of somebody having a test when treatment's not available, but in my experience in, in, in observing in the HIV period was in fact that awareness of, of, of risk and of diagnosis of status was a strong impetus to then bring cheaper drugs and treatment and services to those communities. We then looked at there's issues of infrastructure and that can be infrastructure more broadly, are there labs? If there's not labs, do you jump the technology and say, well, we have to go into the community and do rapid diagnostic tests? Are they good enough? Um, also though, you do not want to have a total compromise on quality. So it's really important to get this balance of being pragmatic about how we get testing out there, but not rescinding on the quality that an individual deserves, no matter what their circumstances, a quality test. As I said, the focus of WHO guidelines are low and middle income countries. So this is not aimed at, at the developed, but we, we look at those guidelines being done elsewhere. It's also, the, the target is, is program managers of saying, who are we speaking to, to try and get them to think about how to look forward to the health services and when they're going for bids for Global Fund or whatever it might be for their funding to say, build these kind of things in. It's a public health approach, ah, the grade process. Grade, you don't actually necessarily want to be part of a guidelines group. Um, the way a colleague of mine, Joe Doyle, describes it is it's kind of like that sort of thing of people saying sausages are delicious to eat, but you don't want to wake, watch the sausage being made. The grade process is a little bit like the making of a sausage. It's not exactly necessarily pretty, doesn't always make sense. There is this real compromise of going, what's the quality of the evidence? What's the overall aim that we're aiming for? And also, what's the pragmatic political balance here? You know, what is the politics more broadly within um, not just WHO, but globally as to what we're trying to achieve? So it's this balance of quality of evidence and strength of recommendations. So you can have varying quality evidence and strengths of recommendations where it can be strong and conditional. Just to make a note, a strong recommendation is when a panel is confident that the desirable effect of adherence to a recommendation outweighs the undesirable effects. And a conditional recommendation is when you're not quite so sure of that. And sometimes there's a lot of discussion as to whether it should be a strong recommendation or a conditional recommendation, um, where you just think it's grey and you, you kind of think sometimes things are bleeding the obvious, it should be a strong recommendation, but actually there's no scientific evidence to support it, so it might be conditional. Sometimes on the balance, you push it up to strong. These are not perfect things and there's a lot of things that get brought into it as you make the decisions, just so people are aware of it. You've got grade, you've got a thing called values and preferences. Feasibility and cost effectiveness all get brought in to get the balance of the recommendations. A really important thing to understand about guidelines, which I hadn't appreciated until a few years ago, was actually the guidelines are in somewhat governed by the questions you decide to ask of the guidelines, so a PICO. So what goes into a guidelines and how you structure the question somewhat informs the guidelines. And so that's the other thing to be mindful of. And you go, well, we should have guidelines on this, 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 and this. But let me tell you, as a person that did the systematic reviews for the first guidelines on hepatitis C testing, care, and treatment, that the cost for my group to do those reviews on behalf of WHO, and I did them cheap for them, was still you know, a proper systematic, a proper true systematic review, particularly if there's no evidence there, costs you know, tens of thousands of dollars. We're not talking about a quick look at the literature, we're talking about a formal systematic review on a PICO. It takes an enormous amount of work. So every question you ask, you've got to think, what does that cost? So when we are critical about why WHO or somebody doesn't do these guidelines and why wasn't this question asked, just think every time, every question is a minimum of 30, I say, well, I'll say 20,000 euro, give or take. And sometimes you can get a volunteer to do them or a medical student. But I'll tell you what, the medical student's nowhere near as your post, good as your postdoc, so your quality of your guideline changes. So when you're talking about models, that's why when you look at it and say, why weren't certain questions asked, just keep that in mind. It costs real money. And if the donors don't give the money, then you don't get the guidelines you necessarily want. So think about that when you're talking to your governments. <coughs> 
So the questions that got asked were who to test, how to test, how to confirm current and active infection, treatment response and disease progression, and the use of dried blood spots. As I said, there, were, there was an attempt to try and be pragmatic. How do we get more testing happening and how can we provide an evidence base? So who to test? In essence, this was a really hard one, and it's because there's not great information. And the final decisions were um, basically that in, in all epidemic settings, offer hepatitis B surface antigen and core hep C antibody testing to adults and adolescents from populations most infected, with clinical suspicion of disease, with sexual partners. In the general population, there was a decision, particularly around hepatitis B, that you would say, if it's above 2% or above 5%, you're thinking, how can it be above both? And that was because of the lack of evidence that was around actually being able to nail that question. But we knew that we would say, well, it'll be country-specific and country-dependent, but we needed to say something about saying, if it's a high prevalence in your population, you probably should be testing most people. As well as the birth cohort effect, it doesn't apply to every country, so have a look at your epidemic. It's always guided by what your epidemic looks like. And routine antenatal testing. What I'll say is, for want of time, that the recommendations were a combination of strong and conditional, but all were low or moderate quality evidence. So we've re made recommendations and you can see them much more clearly laid out here. But what I would really encourage people to do is if you are doing any work, any work on trying to say, who do I test and how do I do it in the populations, please think about it and then write it up and publish it so that the next set of guidelines, we actually have a bit more clarity around what we would think we should be telling countries. Countries with limited dollars trying to work out how best to spend their dollars. So we've made recommendations, they are pragmatic. I wouldn't say they're perfect. I don't think they are. And, we, and when you read through the guidelines, you'll know that. So I would really encourage anybody doing any work anywhere on this kind of thing of how do I think about who to screen, who to test, whatever, to write it up and publish it because of the lack of quality work we've got. How to test? Is it rapid diagnostic tests? Is it lab-based assays? And do you do one test or two tests? So, in essence, the, the, again, I can give you the slides, but the overall way to think about this was, if a country has a nice, beautiful machine that somebody spent dollars on, where they can do central testing, use that if that's the most cost-effective thing to use. If a country doesn't have that machine, and to bring that in, and the training of staff, and the ability to maintain that machine, makes it that that doesn't make sense, and the best thing to do is a diagnostic test in the field, do that. When you looked at the evidence, probably still the big machine that goes bing works better, and is probably more sensitive and specific, but overall the compromise, if you don't have something to do some testing in the field, still is these days good enough. That would be my summary of the guidelines. Um, so for both hepatitis B and hepatitis C. You'll see that there's work around the accuracy of the rapid diagnostic tests can be as good as, but not as perfect. Um, and it depends on the test. And this is also, thank you, where the testing criteria come in and whether it's a registered test and also encouraging the manufacturers of diagnostic tests to register them for pre-qualification for the WHO process or through a process, say like in the USA, Japan, Australia, Canada, some of the European ones, but basically make sure that it's a qualified test was the thing. And this was another thing we really struggled with is that the lack of qualified tests or testing being looked at. Uh, again, so the summary is, if you've got the machine already there, use it and use it well. If you don't, think about a rapid diagnostic it's probably just as good, or use both if one of them makes it that you can do testing way out in the field. The recommendation was a strong recommendation, but the reality was it was low to moderate quality evidence. Again, we need, if anybody's doing this work and you think there's an opportunity if I'm doing some testing, can I align a different test with it to help us answer some of these questions better? Please do that work. And that's in developed countries where we have a little bit more resourcing to inform testing in future for our, our, our other countries. One or two assay strategy. In essence, we came down on, although you lost some specificity, do one test, if you can get away with it, particularly to 
and it, but it, a little bit depended on your background prevalence. So again, you can have a look at the details in the guidelines. But in essence, better to do one test on people and get it done than to not be able to afford to do the two test strategy. And mostly, this was a thing that you could probably get away with pretty well. If you've got a really low prevalence setting of hepatitis B, then you probably, it was worthwhile doing that confirmatory testing. But in other places, in a number of countries in Africa, just do the one test and then go on and do your NAT or whatever it might be. So a single test. Again, there's lots of details around the positive predictive values, the negative predictive values of these things based on the background prevalence and how that changed and how that altered your decisions and your thinking. But that was the summary of our thinking that went into it. Again, though, conditional recommendation, low quality evidence. But we felt something had to be said about how to move this along. How do we actually increase testing? Detection of hep C viremia, and also, I mean, Philippa's slides didn't include it, but also we were looking at hepatitis B as well. And it's basically, for hep C as well, that's why we felt quite confident with hep C, just do a single test if you're going to do an antibody test, because you're going to follow it up with a test to confirm viruses there anyway if you're going to go on to do treatment. So that a single test would be sufficient. That's why it was a little bit different in hepatitis B in terms of some of the decisions we were making. So basically, um, needs to be followed up. In terms of testing, it was felt that an RNA test was better. Where were we up to with the antigen tests? Possibly not quite as good, but in terms of just a screening test, probably sufficient. Recommendation was strong recommendation, moderate to low quality evidence. If you looked at during um, treatment, when the data was, the current data that was available was that to use an antigen test as opposed to an RNA test to monitor treatment outcomes, it was felt that they were not quite there yet. So again, I would, and so it was a, a recommendation, conditional recommendation just to use, um, was okay for um, diagnosis, but not for monitoring of treatment. Again, I would encourage anybody who's doing work at the moment around treatment to be trying to work out, can we build in, working with, you know, a number of companies are, are developing these antigen tests, but Abbott and others to go, can we be using that antigen test? It's a lot cheaper. So if we can be using it to monitor treatment, if we're thinking about how do we get treatment out to resource-limited countries, we need to have a couple of tests that are really cheap, then be thinking about building this into your studies so that we can inform this to improve this from conditional recommendation, moderate quality evidence, where we and we didn't feel at all we could make that same recommendation about monitoring of treatment with the antigen. I'm just trying to think for what of time. Sorry, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, with the core antigen, as I said, it was it was felt we couldn't do the, the data wasn't sufficient to make the recommendation during treatment. Use of dried blood spots again, we know they're not perfect. We know the data is not great but better to be doing a dry blood spot on somebody so that they got a test um, than them not getting a test at all. And so looking at the data, we felt that there was sufficient data to say, yes, you could use dry blood spots for surface antigen and hepatitis C antibody testing, and also for hep B and hep C um, NAT could be considered. And again, you had to think about the circumstances that you're working in, if there were no alternatives, all of those kind of things. So they're very conditional and very, but, but at the, the same time, what's the balance of benefit for the person in front of you? So these recommendations were generally conditional and a combination of moderate and low quality evidence. And again, I can again, but only encourage people to be thinking, how do we actually improve our evidence on this? So each time we do something, think about, you know, can I do some dry blood spots here on the side? as well if you've got a spare little bit of money or convince somebody to give you a small amount of money to add that to the work you're doing. Just Again, we talked about linkage to care as a key issue because at the end of the day, once somebody's been diagnosed, what is the evidence that I can then get them into care? And this was not the key of the guidelines, but again, a real lack of quality evidence about the best ways forward for this. So most of the recommendations on how do I go here's the test, how do I link you into care, were conditional recommendations, moderate and low to very low quality evidence, which is as low as you can get without actually saying something. So one could argue, well, what does that mean? I think what it means is 
we need us again in this room to be contributing better information to make it that people in resource limited countries can actually get access to testing and then link to care. We need to work out ways to make that better. So the road, as I said, this is a, there's a summary in your bag. The guidelines we're hoping will be published soon. I'm, I'm not sure of the date. I meant to check with Philippa and I forgot to ask her that vital question, so I can't tell you. I thought it, at one stage it was going to be around ASLD, so it, I suspect it'll be in the next month or two. Um, there is a, in J Hepatology was a summary of the guidelines, so that's, that is available as well for people to get more details on it. Um, basically, one of the key things is implementation and working with country and country programs to develop up their labs, to develop up their capacity within their labs, or if they don't have the lab work, what do they do? So this is a key area of work being done by WHO at the moment, working with countries. Um, and I would again encourage people to be supportive and, and I know FIND and others are really working on that with UNITAID as well as to how do you actually get these tests in if it's a rapid diagnostic test, how do you make sure though there's quality training. So a lot of training needs to go on. Strategic selection of testing approaches is really important and I think it will vary between countries and as I said the evidence is so far poor, we need to help. So as I said, these guidelines are designed to encourage increased testing. They're pragmatic. They're not based on perfect evidence. We all have a role to help provide better evidence so that the next set of guidelines, we can make stronger recommendations. I suspect we'll be saying the same thing, but we can make stronger recommendations because it makes common sense that we need to do this, but it really helps when a government is making a decision about where they're putting their money, if the recommendations are strong recommendations, high quality evidence, they will feel more compelled to do it than if it's a conditional low quality evidence. So it's not like I suspect we'll have a massive change in view, but the impetus to make governments act changes. There were stacks of people involved with this, thank you. <laughs>